It's great to see such a crowd here this afternoon on a Friday afternoon. I wouldn't have thought that was necessarily possible. Uh, I think it's a real testimony to our speaker and to the, uh, the issues that she's here to speak about, uh, that we have a good group of students out and that we will for, for dinner. So I'm happy about that. I'm Tom Lanny, and I direct the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture at Holy Cross. And I'm grateful to be here today to welcome uh, Winnie Bianima, uh, the executive director of Oxfam International. Now, forgive me for a minute if I indulge in uh, a little backdrop for today's visit. Uh, some of my colleagues will know that I travel occasionally, and uh, especially for my work on global Catholicism. And this story for me begins at 1 a.m. on a flight out of Kampala to London. Uh, I fly a lot, and I still actually stress out about it a lot. Um, I try to introvert on a plane. I have excellent noise-canceling headphones. I have books, and I have little eye things to sleep. Uh, so if you want a seatmate who's uh, just going to leave you alone, I'm the right person. Uh, one night uh, at uh, uh, that 1 a.m. flight, I got on, and I was happy to have a good emergency exit seat, and an interesting person came and sat next to me. And uh, she had a copy of a novel, I'll mention, that I was interested in, Chimamanda Adichie's Americana, and that was on my should I read it or not list. And we sort of struck up a little casual conversation. I could tell I also had a seatmate who wasn't, interested always in being engaged, like a little bit like me in that regard. We struck up a conversation about Americana, and then uh, uh, we talked a little bit about the book, and it became a slow opening into a whole other range of matters. Uh, why I was in Uganda for my research on Catholicism there, her mother's status as a teacher and a first member of her ethnic group to be Catholic in, in her area, uh, our mutual friendship then with a Jesuit named Otomaro, uh, who was my, whose family was my host in Kampala, so interesting things sort of unfolding right there. Her work as director of Oxfam International, her stint working on gender and development at the United Nations. And then finally, how I could think about addressing a whole set of problems that I was thinking about in my own writing that I really wasn't sure how to address, and we talked about those, and she was very helpful to me in that. I stayed up much longer than I imagined that my eyes would allow at that hour of the morning. Winnie Bianyama's story, of course, uh, begins long before that and is really much, much more interesting. She's highly esteemed around the world for her efforts to address poverty, climate change, and income inequality, as well as her work on women's issues and gender and development for the United Nations. She's a leader in democratic governance and peace building. And I'd summarize what I see in her story by saying that she's a woman who knows firsthand about the sometimes enormous challenges to bringing about positive change in the world yet also believes very deeply in the possibility of bringing about such change and has taken so many steps to do so. A native of Western Uganda, Winnie played a direct role in the revolution that overturned the repressive Obote regime and was a signatory of the peace agreement that ended the war. She served 11 years in the Ugandan parliament and served as the country's ambassador to France. She led Uganda's first parliamentary women's congress, championing groundbreaking gender equality provisions in the country's 1995 post-conciliar constitution, which she helped draft. Even before her work with Oxfam began, Winnie's been a player on a global stage. She served at the African Union Commission and as Director of Gender and Development at the United Nations De Development Program. She co-founded the 60-member Global Gender and Climate Alliance and chaired a UN task force on gender aspects of the Millennium Development Goals and on climate change. In February, she was appointed the UN, to the UN's first ever high-level panel on women's economic empowerment. Winnie has helped broker and support women's participation in peace processes in Rwanda, South Africa, Burundi, Sudan, and other countries emerging from conflict. Winnie Bianam is also married, I learned really only after our flight together, uh, to uh, Colonel Kitsa Besija, who is a leader of the, the leader of the opposition in Uganda, who's been fighting corruption in Uganda's government and the electoral processes. When I was in uh, with uh, Otomaro's family, every night on TV we watched basically two things, a uh, real effort, uh, uh, a debate that was going on about the uh, radical criminalization of homosexuality, and that was the first half of the TV, and then the second half was uh, Colonel Besija being chased down uh, by the government a little bit, so uh, it was quite something to see. Only after I left did uh, Father Rodomaro say to me, among other things you've done, do you know who, who else she is? <laughs> so I said, oh, I didn't, didn't know that. Uh, unfortunately, Kiza Basija is under house arrest right now, and I gather was arrested uh, for riding out in a Land Rover just the other day, uh, two days ago. So 
I give all that as background to my claim that Winnie is not naive about challenges, but also knows about possibilities for bringing real change for the better in the world. In her work as executive director of Oxfam International, which, she's taken, uh, which is what she's here to draw our attention to, she's taken the global stage even more forcefully, especially on topics of inequality. She co-chaired the Davos Forum two years ago, and several months ago at the same forum, drew worldwide media attention with a study on how much the top 1% owns of the world's resources. Oxfam, as many of you know, is a world leader in combating poverty and injustice through advocacy, support of civil society, aid in improving the delivery of emergency relief services, and women's leadership and empowerment. I'm very grateful for the chance to learn from her and to engage with all of you in a conversation about such important issues that we all care about. So please join me in welcoming Winnie Bjarnema. Thank you, Professor Thomas Landy, for that very kind introduction. And lecturers, friends, I feel greatly honored to be invited to speak at the College of the Holy Cross today. And I bring you greetings from Oxfam in Oxford, where I work from the headquarters and from the 95 countries around the world where Oxfam works. Learning about your college and your students, meeting you, Thomas, in the way that we did, and meeting the alumni of this college who work for Oxfam, inspires me as much as it humbles me. You ask in your mission statement, what is our special responsibility to the world's poor and powerless? I underline powerless. That's, that's, that's something that really touches my heart. This is the kind of question and the sense of mission rooted in the fight for justice, struggle for justice, that truly sets your college apart. Yours is a college that knows its place in the world and knows with whom it stands with in solidarity. That's important to me. I'm proud that Oxfam's link with the Holy Cross is quite strong, as I found out. It's a collaboration that dates back many years. Holy Cross students have organized and led an Oxford club on this campus. Others have participated in Oxfam student leadership programs Oxfam has particularly benefited from access to truly remarkable students through the generosity of your excellent summer internship program here at your college. And your alumni have also played an important role in keeping our ties strong and deepening them between the campus and Oxfam. In fact, the president of Oxfam America, his chief of staff, Mora is an, alumni of, an alumnus of your college and several others. Your alumni who work for Oxfam in our Boston and DC offices asked me to remind you that they are ready, they are, they are available resources to students who are interested in the nonprofit sector and in international development. So I take the role of colleges and universities extremely seriously. I believe that they have their part to play in taking the world in a better direction. And I'll speak later about this. This belief is not theoretical to me. It's directly shaped by my own experience at university. I arrived at university in the United Kingdom, that is where I studied, as a refugee. I was fleeing the brutal dictatorship of Idi Amin. I was angry, really angry, that I had to flee my country, leave my family, and come to this cold and damp country. <laughs> but it was my experience as a student, a university student at Manchester University, that gave me the opportunity to turn that anger into activism. Upon arriving, 
I immediately joined other students. We organized, we protested, we got involved in fierce intellectual debates. We supported at that time the anti-apartheid struggle against apartheid in South Africa. We used to march, we used to sit in, we pushed our university to divest from South Africa. I got involved in the decolonization struggles that were going on in Africa, particularly Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, and Namibia. I was very active politically at the university. I came, I came alive as an activist. I was at university where I was exposed to global feminist thought. I joined the International Society where I became fascinated by the anti-dictatorship struggles that were going on in Latin America, many of them inspired by Jesuit priests. I studied aeronautical engineering for my undergraduate studies and mechanical engineering for my graduate studies. I spent many hours in the library like all other students, but frankly, to tell you the truth, I was not sitting in the engineering and fluid mechanics section. I was in the Africa section, reading African history, politics, anthropology. That was my favorite corner in the library. <laughs> University really grew me into an activist. I developed skills that have lasted me up to today. I was exposed to politics, to social science, and I connected with struggles, political struggles, human rights struggles. So every time I step back onto a campus, I recall my own experience. You are lucky, my friends, like I was lucky. Not everyone gets this chance. Maybe you are from a family because you are from rich a rich country or rich countries where everyone goes to college, but that's not so for most people. We have to make the most of college life in order to give something back to the world. I have to learn how to do this. Is that right? Okay. I've been asked to talk to you today about inequality and how we can build a better world. Some of you may have read a report that Thomas just talked about, mentioned. We called it an economy for the 1%. We published this ahead of the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos. The World Economic Forum is this place where in January every year, the chief executives of the biggest, richest companies in the world, world pres global leaders, political leaders, presidents, ministers, all assemble in this little resort in the, in the Alps in the middle of the winter in this skiing resort, they meet there, and they shape the global agenda, economic and political agenda. They discuss in informal meetings, but their discussions result in important decisions that shape what is going to happen the rest of the year. So it's an important forum, and I go there representing Oxfam. That report showed that the richest 62 people in the world, the richest 62 billionaires, now have more wealth than the poorest 50% of the world put together. That's 3.6 billion people, half of humanity. The wealth of these 62 individuals has gone up by half a trillion dollars in just five years. So. It's not so much that it's just 62, but it's just that their wealth is increasing so fast. This number we had calculated was 85 individuals two years ago. In two years, they are now 62. In another five years, they could be just a few people who can fit in a little taxi. What's that? 1% of people now own more wealth than the other 99% combined. And it's the rate that is frightening, the rate at which wealth is concentrating in the hands of a few. A global economy has been created that works for the few at the expense of the many. Far from trickling down, 
income and wealth are flowing upwards at a frightening rate. Such obscene levels of inequality make no moral or even economic sense, especially when we know that almost a billion people are still going to bed hungry every night. These are the challenges we must confront. So just after I got back from Davos in January, I spoke with a colleague at Oxfam who was just returning from Myanmar, where we also work. He had been interviewing young women who work in factories, producing clothes for high street brands like Gap, H&M, you know, the ones you know. These women are members of labor rights unions, which Oxfam works with. We try to support these unions. They work six days a week, sometimes seven, sometimes up to 23 hours a day. They earn less than $4 a day and struggle to make ends meet. They frequently fall into debt. If they get sick, they don't get paid. If they get pregnant, they lose their job. I just mentioned to you how 62 billionaires have more wealth than the bottom half of the world combined. Four of those 62 have, have made their money primarily out of this garment industry, including the head of Zara and the head of H&M. It's an industry within which big firms are consistently using their dominant position to insist on poverty wages for those at the bottom of their supply chains. Between 2001 and 2011, 10 years, wages for garment workers in most of the world's 15 leading apparel exporting countries actually fell in real terms. But they pay for the ch chief executives just kept rising. 90% of garment workers in Myanmar are women. 90%. 53 of the richest 62 are men. You see where I'm going? <laughs> Including all the four of those who made their billions in high street fashion. So across the world, women are the ones who are in the worst paid and most precarious jobs. Countries where the gap between rich and poor is more extreme are countries where also the gap between women and men is greater. What is very clear is that the struggle for gender equality and the struggle against economic inequality are sister struggles. When we released our report this year on inequality, one of the criticisms leveled at Oxfam is that we were anti-capitalist. I have to admit I don't care being labeled that. <laughs> we are told the multi-billionaire heads of the high street fashion houses and these young women workers in Myanmar are all part of the same huge global success story and that Oxfam is being churlish, rude, to say otherwise. After all, poverty has been declining over the years, and they give figures. They are right in one way. These young women are living above the globally agreed extreme poverty line of $1.90 a day. So they are officially no longer counted as poor. They've, they are earning $4 a day. But think about it, $1.90 a day, really? Is that what success looks like? Is that what the world should be striving for? I think you know what $1.90 a day buys in your country. The lives of people who live at $1.90 a day the lives of women like those in Myanmar are still unacceptably and unnecessarily tough. They are not lives of dignity. Poverty and powerlessness means 
they are still denied life opportunities that you and I take for granted. I was asked to speak here today about building a better world. We know that there has been remarkable progress in the last 20 years or so in reducing the number of people who live below this extreme poverty line. The first of the Sustainable Development Goals agreed a few months ago in New York is to end extreme poverty. And using this same measure, this same measure of $1.90 by 2030, if we achieve that, it will certainly be a remarkable feat. But is it enough? I don't think so. Those garment workers in Myanmar, when Oxfam talked to them, were spending their day, one day a week, learning about unionizing and what other workers like them had achieved through collective activism in nearby countries like Thailand and Bangladesh. For them, $4 a day is not enough. Not enough to have real choices, not, not enough to be rid of the fear of going into debt. These women aren't asking for a life of super yachts and private jets. No. They are demanding for a life free, free of suffering, a life of dignity. These women must be at the heart of our vision as we strive for a better world. So, we owe it to all these women and to the many millions more like them to do better. We need to create a human economy that works for people rather than the other way around. We need a human economy rather than an economy for the 1%. It's that idea of a human economy that I want to talk about today. Let me unpack it a little. The human economy economy will require big ideas, new ideas. I don't think that those ideas will come from the CEOs whom I meet in Davos or the big politicians. Many of these are good people with good intentions, don't get me wrong. But it's hard for them to see a new path. It's exciting, for example, to hear the head of the World Bank, Jim Kim, he's my friend, I meet him talking of the dangers of inequality and the urgent need to tackle it. I believe that Jim Kim is a man of real integrity, and yet the same World Bank he works for continues to promote policies which can only further fuel the wildfire of inequality that is spreading across the globe, denying millions of poor children, especially girls, from having an education they need and deserve. Every child, every girl that is excluded from school because school is not free is a criminal waste of a future. Let me tell you a story about my own background. When I was growing up in Uganda, there was a girl in my class called Agnes. She was the cleverest girl in my year, always finishing at the top of our class, despite often having to miss school because she had to care for a sick family member, or because she had to help collect water in a dry season, or harvest crops. Agnes was a girl. Agnes was a refugee from Rwanda across the border. Agnes was poor. And these factors intersected to mean that she never had a fair chance in life. She did well in primary school. She was the best in our class despite the obstacles in her way, but Agnes never made it through secondary school. She couldn't afford it. I'm saddened when I think of where Agnes probably is now, not sure where she is. But she still must be very poor, still working incredibly hard and long hours, looking at, trying to look after her family, still with no options in life. And I'm haunted by how unfair this is for her, but also for the rest of us. Just think, 
what we are all missing because we never get to see everything that someone like Agnes could have achieved. I was not as good as her, but I made it and became an aeronautical engineer. What about her? What could she have been? A rocket scientist? An inventor of something bigger than Microsoft? Who knows? Think of the talent, the innovation, the creativity that we are missing out on. Think of how many science or engineers are pounding maize or fetching water as I speak now. Think of how many doctors or teachers are herding goats, goats or digging the dry earth. Imagine a fairer world where we could harness that talent and every child had a chance. Imagine what we could achieve. So our vision for a more human economy must include finding radical new ideas to tackle this grotesque inequality of opportunity and this short-sighted squandering of our greatest asset, the brains, the talents of humanity. So where can we look for the big new ideas? One answer will be colleges and universities, colleges like yours. We must not underestimate the power of academia. It was the work done in universities and think tanks that laid the foundations for the rise of neoliberalism, what the governor of the Bank of England calls market fundamentalism, the ideology of which has come to dominate the world so totally in the last 30 or 40 years, creating untold wealth for the few while driving levels of inequality that hadn't been seen in a hundred years. Such a seismic shift would not have been possible without academics laying the groundwork. It didn't happen by accident. It was an idea born somewhere in a university, promoted, built, argued, debated, sold. Universities must again be ready to play their part, to take the world in a new direction, but a better direction this time. The human economy for Oxfam is one in which governments act on behalf of the majority and not in the interest of a tiny but powerful elite, in which people are valued equally and not disregarded on the basis of their gender, color, or caste, in which we ask how the economy can work better for women and not the other way around, in which businesses show as much concern for their workers, their customers, and the communities within which they exist. As much as they do care about their shareholders and their executive boards. It's an economy where the astonishing advances of technology become something to be welcomed and celebrated by all, rather than some a few, or something that is feared because it will mean job losses for workers and the further accrual of wealth in the hands of a few. I would like to say a little more now about each of those areas, government, business, and technology. We know that poverty and extreme inequality are not facts of life. They're not inevitable. Extreme and widening inequality is a failure of government. Extreme and widening inequality are the products of political and, e and economic choices. Almost four decades ago, governments prompted by the market fundamentalists I've mentioned began that process of economic liberalization and deregulation, and it continues to this day. As governments take more of a back seat, a privileged few, particularly those who had already had access to capital, were able to push ahead, driving today's inequality crisis. That's how it happened. In giving economic freedom to those at the top, 
It is as if government has forgotten about the freedoms of the rest. It's as if the teacher has retreated to the staff room and left the bullies in charge of the playground. You know, I've just come back from a meeting. The Secretary General appointed me on a panel, a high-level panel on access to medicines. And I was sitting around a table with the chief executive of GlaxoKline, Smith Klein, the big pharmaceutical company, other pharma companies, some government leaders, some uh, university professors, and we were trying to think how can we rebalance the right, the human right to life, to medicine, with what GlaxoSmithKline sees as the right to profits. Imagine, because now medicine, health, people's right to life, is, is less or considered equal to the right to a profit. Intellectual property rules have become so important, are regulated, have a whole framework, TRIPS framework, that allows innovators so much room to charge whatever they want. I'll come back to that. I'm passionate. I feel angry that the right to life is not supreme, that it is considered and we have to balance it with the right to money, to profits. But that's where we are. So governments have taken a back seat and allowed those who are ahead to go even further ahead. At the same time across the world, we have seen a narrowing of democratic space in country after country as governments clamp down on hard-won democratic freedoms of the majority. These two forces are linked. Extreme inequality and democracy cannot co coexist for long. There has to be a choice made, either greater equality or less democracy. Government after government is making the wrong choice. Accountable democratic government is the most powerful equalizing force that humanity has ever invented. It's at the heart of the human economy. That's why we must fight for governments to be accountable to their citizens and not the vested interests of big business or the super rich. Governments must be bold in standing up to those interests and in using all the tools available to them, including taxation, public spending, to actively tackle economic and social inequalities. There are examples we can look to for inspiration here. Take Brazil, which is going through a very interesting period right now. Brazil is one of the few countries in the world where the incomes of the poorest 50% actually has been growing at a faster rate than those of the richest 10% in recent years. True. True. There is still a very long way to go for that country. But it's encouraging to see the positive impact of some very sensible and actually not very radical government policies such as a higher minimum wage, more progressive taxation, increased investment in essential public services, and social protection programs. This is not very radical, but it's through those policies that Brazil has, was able to lift millions out of poverty and reduce inequality. Nothing is more powerful in fighting inequality than universal health care or education. International development has often focused on aid. You know, aid will remain important for many countries for a long time to come, especially fragile and conflict-affected states. But ultimately, governments in poorer countries must be able to mobilize their own resources and be held to account by their citizens to spend those resources in a way that benefits everyone. For this to be possible, citizens everywhere must pressure their governments to reject global trade agreements 
that risk making companies more powerful than governments. And citizens must push governments to radically reform global tax rules that are making it so easy for the richest individuals and the biggest multinationals to avoid paying their fair share of tax in the countries where they operate. This is only shifting the burden still further onto the least able to afford it. I'm sure you've been following the Panama Papers scandal. Well, need I say more? Multinationals are blackmailing governments to give them ludicrous tax breaks with the threat of taking their operations <coughs> elsewhere if governments don't concede. This is driving a race to the bottom on tax, Most, much like the race to the bottom that we are seeing on wages, on workers' rights, and on environmental sustainability. It's estimated that poor countries are losing at least $170 billion every year because of tax avoidance. Tax avoidance is all the legal ways that companies and rich people can use to avoid paying their taxes. Legal. They are all legal ways, accounting tricks. This is significantly more than the total amount that these same countries are receiving in aid. You see the senselessness of it. This is more, what they lose is even more than what they receive as aid. We are seeing a huge groundswell of public anger against tax dodging and some progress against it. And we must keep up this fight against the Googles, the Starbucks, and the billionaires who are paying lower taxes than their secretaries or cleaners. It's just not right. But we are fighting and we are making some progress. Responsible businesses must have a central role to play in our vision for a human economy. Many have pointed out that the private sector must invest in order to achieve the sustainable development goals, and that's, that's right. But it's sensible for us to identify which goals may be more appropriate for private sector engagement and which must remain truly publicly funded. Universal health coverage, for example. Experience shows that the only way of ensuring decent public services for all is for governments to take the responsibility for delivering them and for citizens to hold those governments accountable for how they are delivered. The role of the private sector then is primarily to ensure that they are paying their taxes. Oxfam is sometimes accused of being anti-business. This isn't true. We work with many private sector companies to find innovative way ways to help those in need. A great deal of our work with communities around the world involves helping people develop their own businesses and get access to markets. I would have liked to give you an example, but I don't have time. So, we are not anti-business. What we are against is the kind of business that puts profit above all considerations, and as a result, decides to pay poverty wages if it thinks it can get away with it. Companies that decide to stash their money in tax havens rather than contribute to the societies upon which their businesses depend. Companies that decide to cut corners rather than ensure environmental sustainability. Or businesses that actively lobby for the opportunity to abuse their workers and destroy the planet. We are most certainly against such businesses. Instead, we want to think creatively about different ways of running our private comp sector companies, where workers have more a controlling interest, for example. This could mean creating more democratic decision-making within companies. Pay ratios in a, com in a country like Germany, for example, haven't spiraled upwards in the way they have done, say, in the UK and the United States, 
Why? Because employee representation on remuneration committees prevents that from happening. That's a solution. But we could take it even further. Employee ownership models are on the rise in many countries. These cut the distance between decision makers and those impacted by the decisions. At Oxfam, we are proud of our role, our role in supporting cooperatives such as Amul in India, which is the largest milk brand in that huge country, and jointly owned by 3.6 million Indian dairy farmers. These are businesses that, when successful, automatically share value and profits with workers and farmers, rather than with shareholders who are often remote from the reality of the business or the community within which it, ex which it exists. So there are, there are models to think about of business that can give reward to many people and also not damage our planet. Third, technology. As new technologies continue to be developed, the question of who controls them and who stands to profit from them becomes even more important. Technological progress is at the heart of the human economy. Technology has incredible power to liberate. I think of the power of electricity. This for me is magical because I grew up in a house without electricity. I came home after the removal of Idi Amin and two years later when I went to my parents' house, I could switch on a light. But for all those years I was in their house, my parents' household, we were always using a, a kerosene lamp to read, to do everything at night. So, so electricity, which for me I see as magical, grinding maize, pumping water, all these things release women from countless hours of backbreaking work and allow children to study once the sun has gone down. You know, my mother had invested in a powerful kerosene lamp. It was called a pressure lamp because you could get a brighter light out of a pressure lamp. And because my home had this pressure lamp, I had a step ahead of my other classmates in school. I could do homework with a good light. My classmates couldn't. They had this hurricane lamp with poor light. My best friend would come to spend a night at our home before an exam because we had a better light in our house. So you can imagine that these very basic technologies, the difference they make in terms of opportunity for millions of people. So we must build societies in which the arrival of new technology brings hope and the promise of shorter working hours, less backbreaking labor, a better quality of life for all, as indeed it has in many societies at different points throughout history. But right now, most countries are far from that. Oxfam has been doing a lot of work with tea, tea pickers in Assam, in India. With a little support from us, these tea pickers have been successful in driving up their wages and their working conditions. That's the positive part. But now, the bosses of the companies have said to them, if wages go up anymore, they might decide to invest in machines that can take the place of the tea pickers themselves. Whole communities would become jobless, with no realistic prospect of finding alternative employment without moving to the slums of big city, cities hundreds of miles away. Think about it just beginning to increase their wages, and the company owners say, we're going to bring machines and, and make you unemployed. So our human economy must strike a careful balance when it comes to the interests of innovators and the public interest. Of course, it's right that those, there should be a fair reward for the pioneers of new technologies. They invest. They invest a lot of money, they invest their intellectual uh, capacity, and they take risks in the process.
That's why there's copyright law and intellectual property protection. But these days they don't even call it intellectual property protection. They call it intellectual property rights and make it equal to human rights. How absurd. But there must be limits. Such patents can create monopolies, allowing their owners to accumulate vast wealth that's wildly disproportionate to the inv investment they've made. And this is where I want to say a little bit about access to medicines, an area where Oxfam has worked for a long time. The imbalance can often be akin to a death sentence. The current research and development system is skewed towards rewarding innovation at the expense of people's health and undermines the human right to health. We saw an extreme example just a few months ago when an American former hedge fund manager bought the patent for a drug called Daraprim. This treats a life-threatening parasitic infection. The new owner bumped the price up. He's not the one who even invented the medicine. He bought the company. He bumped the price up overnight from $13.5 to, listen to this, $750 per tablet. From $13.50 to $750. Instantly ensuring that it could be available only for the rich. Martin Shrelly, that's his name, CEO of the company Turing, the company that bought the drug, he said when he was challenged about this, quote, no one wants to say it. No one's proud of it. But this is a capitalist society, a capitalist system and capitalist rules, unquote. That was his answer. I can do it, so I do it. We also saw this in the unaffordable prices of HIV treatment a few years ago. We fought that. And we see it now in the medicine to treat hepatitis C, which costs $1,000 a day. How rich must you be? This is completely unacceptable. Nor is this only a problem for developing countries. New cancer medicines now are reaching the market at prices that are unaffordable, whether you are a rich European or a rich American. Or, or let me say moderate, moderately rich. So the current global R&D model has failed patients all over the world. Pharmaceutical companies justify their high prices by the need to recover their research costs. Yet the actual research cost is kept secret and the pharma companies ignore the fact that a lot of the research is actually done by public money in universities and in research institutions sometimes. One of Oxfam's greatest campaigns was standing with others to face down pharmaceutical companies to ensure generic companies could compete to reduce the price of anti-HIV medicines from $10,000 per patient per year down to $100 per year now. Because of that campaign, millions of people are alive today. In a human economy, we need a new approach entirely. We must separate the financing of research and development from the pricing of medicines. It can't be left to pharmaceutical companies to cater only to those who can afford to pay high prices, practically deciding who lives and who dies. Finally, the human economy must be one that lives within the boundaries of the planet. Oxfam has demonstrated that whilst the poorest people live in the areas hardest hit by climate change, the poorest half of the population are responsible for only 10% of global carbon emissions. It isn't the most vulnerable and the poorest people who have caused this climate crisis. I always like to cite my peasant uncle in the village in Uganda. I use him as a point of reference. It would take him 180 years to register the same emissions as an average American would in one year. 180 years. 
our broken economic system is not only failing to deliver for the majority, it's destroying the planet for our children and our grandchildren. We have the ability to live within planetary boundaries using the technology we have already. This is why, for example, this is why for us, Oxfam, the fight against extreme inequality and the fight against climate change are joint struggles and against the same enemy, a dangerous, destructive economic system that has to change and change fast. So these are just some of the questions that students at a college like yours might seek to answer when thinking about building a better world. How do we create a more human economy which works for women as well as men? How do we make sure that governments are accountable and act in the interests of their citizens rather than big companies and the super rich? How can we support and grow the kinds of businesses that will contribute positively to the societies within which they exist? How can we ensure that technologies make life better for the world's poorest rather than leaving them still further behind? How can we ensure that inequalities of wealth do not translate into inequalities of access to life-saving medicines? How can we preserve and protect the planet for future generations? How can we create a world in which both extreme poverty and extreme wealth belong to the history books and become relics of a bygone age? In defining the human economy, we need big, bold new ideas. We will be ridiculed as naive. Sometimes we are told we are envious, seditious, or all of that. See that as a badge of honor. At least I do. This great college, like I said earlier, knows its place in the world. Responsibility towards the poor and the powerless sits at the heart of your mission. The question you must ask yourselves now is, what does success look like for you? As you set off on your exciting journeys after graduating from Holy Cross, whatever it is that you go on to do, I ask that you ensure it resonates with the struggle of these garment workers I spoke about. And to the millions of others like them, like my friend Agnes, who are sitting below or just above the so-called poverty line and have the odds stacked against them now, but who are also determined to imagine a more equal world and a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will. So we can take some questions. There's a mic in the center I'd ask you to use. Can you say your name on what you study? Sure. Um, Hi, um, I'm Asmani Adav. Um, I'm a junior here, and I'm a biology major with a concentration in women and gender studies on the pre-med track. Um, a mouthful, but um, I was just wondering um, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, kind of a concrete way to kind of uh, like convince these big companies to do the right thing. How do you incentivize these big companies, like the majority of which, like these rich people that are majority men, how do you in, or, um, Make, like, convince them that it's the right thing to do to fight for gender equality, to fight for a human economy, as you put it, and to stop commoditizing human life. I just was wondering if you had any like, concrete ways to do that. Small question. <laughs> should I take that, or should I take a few? I answer that? OK. That's a very good question. How do you persuade companies to change their ways? Well, there are some things we can do, but most of them are really about mobilizing the power of people, organizing people to pressure the companies. They're not going to change because 
they have been persuaded that they were doing the wrong thing and now they want to be nice people, nice company. They change because there's pressure. Their consumers are not happy with them. Their shareholders are under pressure. It's pressure. And Oxfam has ways we do this. I'll share with you one example. We have a, a campaign we call Behind the Brands. Oxfam works with farmers around the world. A lot of our work is with smallholder farmers, and we care about them getting a decent... They work hard. They work harder than these companies. We care that they should get a decent wage, and we care that their environment is not destroyed. So food companies are very important to smallholder farmers. So we have selected the 10 biggest food companies in the world. They include Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Nestle, uh, companies like Mondelez. Most of, six of them are actually American companies. Others are European, Latin American. These 10 companies, we invited their CEOs. We developed a scorecard, and we said, we're going to score you on these seven issues. And we're going to publish our scores, how you're doing. And they are to do with their policies on their supply chains, how they treat workers, how they treat women, how they treat water resources where they are, land grabbing. Are they grabbing land from peasants? Um, climate change. We, we had a, an indicator for there are carbon emissions and a number of uh, seven indicators, mostly to do with their social impact and also their environmental impact. They didn't want it, but we said we're going to, we invited them, but we said we're going to do it so you can cooperate or you can fight, but we're going to publish. So actually they accepted to let us into their company and to actually examine their policies in these seven areas. Every six months, we put out a report. It triggered a race to the top. These 10 companies didn't like the fact that they were at the bottom of the scorecard. This is a very American thing, by the way. <laughs> you like scorecarding, and you like competing, and it really worked. So they were, I would go to Davos, and they'd be chasing me around Davos to talk to me, to say, you didn't score us right, you know. This report is not fair because we had actually done this and done this and, you know, not stand my ground. Say, no, our evidence is that <laughs> it gave us a lot of power over them. We used consumers. In, in this campaign, we've pushed them. They have declared zero tolerance to land grabbing. They've put in place those policies on zero tolerance to land grabbing. We did a spike on women's rights in the cocoa industry as part of this campaign. You know, cocoa is grown in about eight countries around the world only. Not many countries grow cocoa. And in some countries, it's grown by women mainly. They are the, the farmers, women farmers. They were getting a poor wage. They were not being treated well. And we then asked the companies, the chocolate companies, we did the campaign around Easter time. You people like this habit of Easter egg. I don't know it, but I learned about it. The chocolate business. So around Easter time, we mobilized consumers, and we said, well, these three companies have not put in place policies to give women a living wage. This is what they earn in Ghana for growing cocoa. This is what you're paying for your chocolate in the shops. And all the money in between is going to, the, to Nestle. And oh my God, these companies within three months had put in place the policies that we asked them to put in place. Just by mobilizing the consumers, scorecarding them, they moved. So those are some of the techniques we use. We mobilize consumers, we mobilize their shareholders, we mobilize people, publics. We, we use evidence, we scorecard them on the base of evidence. We say, this is where you are, can you move further? And they do. And then now we have moved that campaign to implementation. We move them on policies. 
We're now moving them to implementation. Have, are you walking the talk? The talk. So it works. It's a lot of work. It, me, it needs many people. It needs young people like you. It needs consumers. It needs everybody. It's pressure. It's mobilization. And gathering evidence. Uh, my name is Tsitsi Mashaure, and um, I'm a visiting lecturer in anthropology, and I'm from Zimbabwe. Um, and I teach a class on gender and development, and I was wondering if you could speak to the historical timeline. So it appears the extreme inequalities have worsened in the recent future, or in the recent years, rather. And uh, I was wondering if you could explain what has changed internationally in the global community that has intensified these income inequalities and uh, related to that uh, in your meetings with national governments from uh, countries in Africa, the global south, how do African leaders and leaders from you know the global south sort of explain what is happening in their countries? Do they feel that the situation is getting more difficult for them to um, come up with policies that are positive for their people? Like, has something dramatically changed in the last 10 years, in the last five years, to contribute to these extreme inequalities? I could say that this has been going on for the last 30 years at least. This has been, and I've, I saw it as a university student. I saw it growing. It's been going on for the last time. And there are two main, main um, factors I see that have driven us to this point. One are the policies that I talked about of deregulation, privatization, of, that drove this globalization process of state governments stepping back and allowing the private sector to have free reign in the economy. This is thinking that came about more or less in the, around the 80s, the 70s, really. It was actually manufactured in some of your American universities, some of your best universities, no names mentioned. <laughs> and this thinking became so prevalent, was driven by political leaders. I remember this happening in the times of Margaret Thatcher when I was a refugee in England, Ronald Reagan here. And at that time, these political leaders made greed fashionable and acceptable. They allowed companies to practice, to, to, to take over the economy and to, to loosen state regulation and allow them a free hand. Those policies really rolled back the, 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 the rights of individuals and gave companies more rights in the economy. Workers lost, for example, their bargaining power. Unions were crushed. Wages were suppressed. And, uh, and, and you, you needed to be a yuppie to come straight from university and start earning half a million dollars in one year. That was success. But, but for workers to have stagnant wages, to lose their jobs, was not seen as, as failure. It was seen as, that's okay, those are losers. So that kind of thinking and the policies that came with it and their justification through politics it was one driver. And, and it continues today. In fact, progressives, we are seen as uh, bad for the economy. So we, that's why I'm saying we need new thinking coming from universities to justify a human economy, to say that success is when everyone has a job and not just any job, but a decent job that pays well, that puts kids in college, that, that success is when the state supports health for everybody, not health for those with money and, and jobs, but health for everyone and so on. So that's one set of, one driver, liberalization. 
The other driver related to that, in my view, is political capture. Our politics became captured by, again, those few who were ahead, who had the money. We started seeing politics being so dominated by the money that comes through the media, through financing of political parties, and the whole rules of political finance, of, of political lobbying, were also loosened. You, had now, you now have a situation where elections are literally bought, in, in, both in rich and poor countries. They are bought. If you have the money, you take it. And so democracy was undermined. The voices of citizens were crushed. And they continue to, it continues to be like that. Tell me, how much chance do you have... How m- but I, I'm seeing positive things here. I'm seeing, for example, a candidate here who is raising a lot of money from individuals, competing with a candidate who has a lot of money from companies. That's positive. That, that's people fighting back and trying to claim back democracy. But democracy in many countries has been hijacked, particularly because of also technology coming in, that people use media and you buy the media, so you bring money. But also parties are bought by companies. Pharmaceutical companies, for example, here in the United States, pay about $487 million every year to lobby Capitol Hill. Did you know that? $487 million every year to lobbyists to lobby for, and you know, they are not lobbying to give everybody medicine. (laughs) They are are lobbying to reduce the taxes to them. So they buy the democracy, they buy the regulation, they rig the economy. So political capture is, is another driver. And unless we can claim back the democracy, We don't have a chance. The economy is rigged. It's rigged in favor of those few. So those two processes, to me, are what have really led us into a state where economic inequality is spiraling out of hand. It won't reverse unless we reverse those two trends. One, we we must address it from an intellectual standpoint, attack it, show how morally it's bankrupt, but also how economically it's unviable and sustainable and environmentally unsustainable. And mobilize people to say no, just the way Dutch and Reagan mobilized to make it all acceptable. So that's how I see it. Hi. Uh I'm Joe Blondo. I'm a sophomore studying political science. I uh, just want to say thank you for coming. Uh, I thought your message was really powerful, powerful, and I appreciate you speaking to us. Uh, I guess the question I have is a little more uh, economic-driven. So companies that are American-based and outsource jobs to other countries um, that pay their workers, you know, for instance, you know, $1.90 a day is obviously incredibly wrong. And I'm wondering your thoughts as to whether or not to reform countries being able to outsource and not be able to exploit workers in other countries, or would that create a worse problem where the countries withdrawing or companies withdrawing from other countries would actually take away jobs and money from uh, these people? I hope I've understood your question. You're, you're looking for what's the solution to that? whether or not it would be better to make countries or companies not exploit workers in other countries or would mm-hmm. it be better to have com- country companies keep their uh, you know factories and whatnot at, and in their home country well I think that we have our universal human rights that should we should actually drive coherence in universal instruments you, you can't have countries, on the one hand, signing off universal human rights, hmm? the right to health, the right to a job, the right to health, the right to all these things, 
and at the same time sign another agreement where the right to health is or whether the right to a job and the right collective bargaining is now sacrificed through another treaty that is supposed to govern the economy, like a TRIPS agreement, a trade agreements. You can't have a trade agreement that is signing away the human rights of people while at the same time you sign the Universal Human Rights Charter. There, we must drive coherence across agreements that governments make internationally. And that means that the richer countries have got something in their hands that they can use. They, they, they can be the moral drivers of this. They can be the ones that say, look, you are not paying the wages that the minimum wage, a global minimum wage, therefore our industries will not locate there. That's a moral choice they can make. And that's also, that also would mean that now we are moving towards coherence. We need to revise some of the international instruments that just allow this competition to the bottom, that sacrifice the other agreements. So my answer to you is that we need global economic governance that is consistent with that is consistent that reflects the human rights that we've all signed on to and we need leaders we need governments particularly richer governments driving that coherence across the international system the global governance system but right now we have a broken system we have a, a, a united nations system we have an economic system that even the greatest power on earth the united states doesn't agree with, sometimes uh, takes unilateral action against and because it's a broken system. So I believe in internationalism. I believe in a system, a global governance system that's just, that's inclusive, that's democratic, and that's coherent, where human rights come first and all other instruments, all other agreements are consistent with the values we have agreed. Do I answer your question? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Claire Ori. I'm a sophomore here uh, studying international studies in French. Um, so you talked a lot about how um, states have to be accountable to their citizens and always be promoting um, their general welfare and ensuring access to these social services. And so I was just curious, um, in your work in the development program of the UN, have you found that the work you're doing is more or less a, a product of states failing to uphold these responsibilities? And um, if so, can it be difficult then to collaborate with them, you know, to be promoting long-term development goals um, and things of that matter? Yes, governments have, are failing in their responsibility. First, as I said, a lot of them are in a cozy bed with companies and with rich people. They are not serving the interests of their citizens, particularly of their poor people. That's a fact. When I worked at the United Nations, I saw that all the time. My job was to advise them about what works, and I had the best examples. I had the money. In, I had a budget to pilot, to show what, what's good policy, what can make a difference, what's a good program, and I would, I would make it available. They didn't use it. They didn't use any knowledge. They did things that served the interests of those who were controlling them. So, yes, governments are responsible, but do not take up their responsibility. And again, it comes to, th there is no other way except to tackle power. And Students, you can tackle power. You can speak to your representatives. You can talk to, to, to politicians. You, you have a voice, especially when you're in a country that is democratic or fairly democratic like yours. You can make a difference. In the developing countries where we work, in many of those countries, the political space has been shrinking and is shrinking further. And it's tough to work there. 
but we keep also reinventing ourselves, changing our strategies and trying to see how best to support local actors to assert themselves. We have to balance the power, the power that the governments have, supported by the money of the companies and the power of people. So we work on that. We deliberately, we, we look at it as a question of power. It's a question of power. It was interesting, your question about working with the United Nations, because indeed, sitting at the United Nations and having a role of advising governments, it was, I learned so much about how governments, the opportunity that is there and the opportunity that is lost. They have everything, many of them, they need to make a difference, but they choose not to. They choose policies that work for a few. Let me give you an example on uh, women's rights, for ex uh, an example on women's rights. You know, in my country, Uganda, education is free for at the primary school level, but is not free at the secondary school level. Now, at the, neither is it free at the university level. But then the government decided that we are going to uh, support women's rights through affirmative action, and we are going to have a quota for female students at the university because few girls go through secondary school, so we'll give them more space to get into colleges once they've overcome the hurdle of secondary school. It sounds good, but I did, we did a research and showed them that actually this window of opportunity, this affirmative action you're giving to women, girls, students to get into college is not benefiting poor girls. It's actually benefiting your daughters <laughs> because it's benefit because when you look at who goes through secondary school and gets to apply to university, the secondary schools that make it to university are the top schools where the daughters of ministers and top civil servants go to school. Those are the ones who make it close to get to university. So when you give a little lift up, you give it to one of those because the poor have been eliminated at primary school level. Don't ever complete secondary school. So the chance at college is not for them. So you keep telling them, look, you, you, thank you for the affirmative action, but it's not helping anyone except your own daughters. They don't listen. You give them the evidence, they, don't, they pretend they haven't seen it. So that's what I mean, that we could generate evidence of what works, show it to them, and it's like they haven't heard you. It's deliberate. It's about power. So we have to tackle power. One more question? Yeah. One more. Hi, my name is Matt Walsh. I'm a freshman prospective political science major. I was just wondering, um, I think in the U.S. one of the biggest problems we have is apathy, whether it be apathy from being oppressed for so long that you feel your voice doesn't matter or apathy from privilege mm -hmm. because you have so much privilege that you don't understand the plight of the impoverished. How do you think we can fix that problem? Apathy. You know, when you say apathy, I, I think that implicit in that is you're, you're blaming someone who is being inactive politically. And you're probably right. But I also think that for many people, they really genuinely see that this is a rigged system and my action is not going to change anything and then choose to do nothing. So they are overwhelmed by the power of those who've taken over political decision making, policy making. So the solution to that is to show people the ways through which they can make a difference. I think that most people will act if they think that that act 
can result in something positive. But the fact is that majority of people look at this rigged system and say, well, I can't, I, I can't do anything. There's nothing I can change here. That's what you call apathy. So for me, apathy can be solved by showing people the small steps that they can take that are collective with others result in change. And that's where young people, you have opportunity to do this. You are on a campus, you debate, you don't stop at debate. Plan actions, plan actions, and through those actions, connect with communities around you, whether at the university or where you live. Take the action somewhere. I think that many times, young people have less to lose than older people. Older people sometimes are scared. My employer will hear that I was part of this group and will ask me questions. My housing, my young people. When I was on the campus at university, oh my God. <laughs> we did everything we wanted to do. So I challenge you. I think that I'm, I'm throwing it back at you. I think you, you, you are overwhelmed by the forces and, and I think that I understand that. But break it down to a few actions, connect them to the actions of others, change happens. You need to lock in your effort with that of many others, other movements. Your one percent, what was it called here, one percent or 99? There was a movement here. We are the 99. We are the 99. Find a way to lock into a movement like that. There are movements about uh, political financing, changing political financing, lock into that, do your action that leads to that. There are movements. Find your own action and lock into some wider action. It's fun. It's empowering. You begin to feel that you're not just a number, a meaningless person in a, a system that's been taken over. You feel, uh, you know, purpose, sense of purpose. So I encourage you, do it. Join Oxfam. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.